Mr. Baldus. What is that? They were short and concise. You're ready, you're ready to go. So Dr. Ferris, want to introduce Kevin Baldus? Yes, I would like to introduce our new director of special education, Mr. Kevin Baldus. Thank you. <laughs> I wasn't expecting an applause. <laughs> so I have eight slides to share with everybody tonight. I uh, really want to go into uh, some data, some explanations, some uh, just kind of doing a little narrative about uh, where we're at currently, uh, some past trends, some, uh, some current things that we're working on for the school year and then uh, for the future for next year and moving forward. Um, so the, the chart that you have in front of you is just a breakdown of, of our special education population right now uh, by disability area. Uh, not much of a change from last year. The only increased area that we've had uh, percentage-wise is in the emotional disability category, which is up about uh, 5% uh, from last year. Um, the two little areas that uh, aren't uh, very distinguishable is this, uh, are our vision uh, and hearing uh, students uh, that qualify for special ed services within those two areas, and they're just one of those kids each. So it's a small percentage, but uh, still a very important part of is, our department. Is the yellow other health, are those 504s? No, 504s are not included in, in uh, this Okay. Moment. Nope. Um, other health impairment is more like OHI. Uh, students with ADHD, I mean, there's okay. a widespread of ones that would fall underneath that category. Gotcha. Uh, for for um, receiving, receiving special ed services. Um, there is uh, a, you know, overall, I said like a 5% increase in the ED population. Um, I did do a breakdown chart of, of the racial breakdown into our department, but I think it's very important to acknowledge that uh, within our uh, currently uh, 200 and uh, is it uh, two, 228 kids uh, that we have in special ed that 47% uh, of those are, are Caucasian or white, 37% uh, Hispanic, 11% African American, uh, about 3.5% uh, uh, multi-races, and uh, just almost 1% in Asian. Uh, so I think it's something to also take account um, within uh, our population in the special education department. Um, if you want to go to the next page. Thanks. A lot of numbers, a lot of things up there that I want to kind of go through and point out a little bit. Um, one of the trends that sticks out to me when you look at these numbers is the growth of our special education numbers in population is, is in, um, in consistent with, uh, not consistent with the growth of our population of enrollment here at RB. Um, our enrollment is, you know, for the last four or five years, about one and a half percent growth. We're in a special education department that was about 16.9% growth. Um, I, I equate some of that growth of, of that percentage of our population due to uh, um, being special ed for, you know, in this area for about 22 years is within the last four or five years, we've seen a significant increase in students with social emotional concerns, hospitalizations, uh, a lot of uh, diagnosis with anxiety, depression, uh, which has then uh, transitioned over to some kids with some uh, some truancy issues and school refusal. Um, and typically in our, our in, in special ed, when those students are identified, they go through a process in our building, uh, usually through counselors or staff members uh, um, and deans really all get involved in recommending those kids uh, to uh, case study evaluations through small teams or SIT, and they get to me where we then recommend them for services um, do a domain hearing or, or evaluation process. Um, and those are trends that are consistent uh, in the United States and in the state of Illinois right now. Those numbers are just increasing as, just not because of COVID this year, it's more, a more significant increase. I mean, uh, one of the numbers that I had previously, we are currently in the middle of about six case, uh, case study evaluations uh, in, in our special, ed special education department. Um, that are, many of them are due to those SCL, those social emotional concerns of, the, of just struggling of, of when we, and Ms. Lindquist says, so, so zoomed out, they're not around people. Um, and some of our kids that they need those one-on-one -on -one interactions and, and get recommended for special education services. Um, 
one of the other things that stick out to me is, is our transition program. Um, Ten years ago, really wasn't in, ex in existence. I talked to uh, Ronnie Carey and uh, Melissa Hammer, our two transition coordinators, and, and within those courses, they've continued to see a rise in um, one child find was a big part of this, that we had kids uh, that are identified at an earlier age and that when they were ready to uh, hopefully graduate at a, on a four-year path, just wasn't something that was gonna lead them to, towards future success. Ideally, in special ed, an IEP is meant to set students up for transition after high school. And, and, and for some, that is after four years. For some, that's when the day before they turn 22 years of age. And that's really um, not just you know, an individual uh, decision, but an individual team decision that really drives um, those numbers. And in transition, we see kids that are in there for one year, two years, and some that are, again, in there until their 22nd, the day before their 22nd birthday. But getting them job training, getting them out in the, in the community, connecting them with uh, different uh, uh, avenues for success based on their individual needs uh, post high school. Um, the bottom one, uh, one of the things that uh, this year, uh, due to COVID and the lack of numbers of kids in our department that were in session, that the, the pair numbers. We had two pairs that um, retired last year, and though they were not replaced due to uh, one of them was a one-on-one -on -one aid with a student that left, uh, so that, that direct connection wasn't needed, um, but it dropped for um, a, just a decrease in the needs. Um, if we, I think if we had a full on school year, that number would have been higher. We would have looked to hire some more pairs in those classes. Um, but uh, moving forward, I think that number is going to, I definitely know that number is going to go up next year uh, because we have some incoming eighth graders that have uh, required one to one aids in their IEPs. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit more as like program specific needs. Um, and so I see, I envision a like a 2.5 increase in uh, in Paris for next year, um, um, for those two students that need one to ones and one floor, kids that need support in other classes during their school day. Um, uh, any questions on that so far? <laughs> There's a lot of numbers. There. Yeah, Kevin, just make sure you're touching the questions I forwarded to you. And yep. Otherwise, just stick to your presentation. You're fine. Okay. So you're on the revenues page now? Uh, actually, one more thing about the outplace students. Uh, I got a question about the outplace students. I want to address that a little bit. Uh, there was a question about uh, we've seen a significant rise in the number of students that are outplaced in, in, uh, uh, for, for multiple different reasons and, and the question of why. I think it relates back to the identification of kids and, and that growth of those numbers overall. I think it's also an increasing significance of the, the, like profound uh, challenges that so many, many of them are having in, in their lives. Uh, some of the kids that are being hospitalized that just are having school anxiety that just are not able to manage themselves in a traditional school setting um, for multiple different reasons. Um, moving forward, we do have, by the end of this course of this school year, we will have nine students that will be graduating, exiting, or aging out uh, in our, out, our outplacement. So that nine, there'll be nine dropping off of that total number. Um, anticipating next year an uh, additional uh, four students that are outplaced uh, coming from our feeder schools, um, one residential and three that actually will be going to uh, LRV, which I'll t just talk about in a little bit. Um, we talk about that program that we have with LT and LATSE. Um, in our residential, within those numbers, we have five residential outplaced students um, at the end of this school year. Uh, that number drops uh, by two, the, and then we have one student that will be uh, residentially placed currently um, and, and will stay in that, that placement coming here as a freshman next year. So yes, the next picture, please. So revenues, uh, not very much to say about that. It's, you know, that's the money coming in that we, we have to help support our students in, in special ed. Um, you know, it's pretty consistent. It's usually the one I don't get really many questions about the money coming in. It's the money that's going out. I'll get questions <laughs> on the next page. So, <laughs> so expect that. So we can go to the next page if you'd like, Graham, please. Thank you. So on the expenditures, um, you know, with the increase of students 
in special ed, that's obviously going to drive the cost of special education uh, up. Um, as student, more and more students are identified and requiring special ed services, those services are, 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 are going to cost quite a bit um, because they're outside the normal um, access that they have to their, uh, an average student would have to their education in, in the high school setting uh, here at RB. Um, all outplaced students are, because of that larger number that we saw on the previous slide, have increased. Those are our significant financial um, uh, investments in those kids to put them in an outplacement school. And I, I think of them as investments in their, in their future. Uh, so I would say it's, it is quite expensive, but it is a, it's an investment in, in their, their opportunities to be successful and, and meet their needs that we've identified through uh, the evaluation process. Um, so the net cost is the 6.1, and then when you offset that from the revenue that you showed on the previous page, the other 4.8 is what basically comes out of our ed fund, correct, Chris? Correct. Okay. So do we have a, a readily available um, like per pupil cost? I mean, does the report card include a per pupil cost? Of yeah. outplacement or just our, our own? Uh, of the full special per ed pupil program. cost is something around 14000 485 something on like that in that range it's in the handbook okay so the the expense is any of that reimbursed to us through the state or is that all from what we provide That's through the our revenue property page, right? yeah. the revenue on the, page on, the, on the previous yeah. page shows we get about 290 in reimbursement mm -hmm. and the reimbursement is always a year behind um, and so if costs go up one year the following year the reimbursement will will go up a little bit as well but most of the um, special education revenue comes from reimbursement either at the state or the federal level. So does this mean about 18% of our budget is, no, um, it's about one-fifth of our budget, right, is special ed, if I, our overall budget, if I'm looking at that correctly? Uh, if you look at total expenditure is $6 million, our overall budget is roughly 26, Kristen? Yes. So close to 25%. 25% of our 25%. Okay, so but 25% of our entire school budget then is um, earmarked or dedicated for special ed, and that that's probably up, right? I'd say that's probably increased. Um, it's else. pretty consistent with 2020. If you look at there's a 10-year, you saw the significant increase in 19 and 18. 18 and 19, you saw a significant increase. Um, from previous years. 2013, you're at 2.8. So, I mean, over the last eight years, you've seen a significant increase. Almost $3 million. Yeah, so that's just a commitment that school districts make to their community that I don't know that everybody realizes. You know, well, I don't know if it's a commitment. I mean, it's a legal obligation. Well, I know it's an investment. As you yeah, it's, right. It's an investment. I mean, here's my right. thought is, and what, what's it going to do in the next four? It's going up a million dollars every four years, or a million and a half well, dollars. Is it going to? Is this the cost of the resource going to be a million more dollars in four more years, just because it costs more money? So, like the textbooks cost more money, right? Well, we have transportation so, and all these things. Right. We have to educate the children within our borders, right? If they live in 208 no matter, right, we have to give them a fair and equitable education. And so if they come from somewhere else or from the feeders with an IEP, we have to educate them. Um, I would say generally speaking, and, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, but the trend is to get away from giving IEPs and more IEPs in the elementary. I mean, obviously, you want to meet every kid's needs, but I think trying to do some MTSS and other interventions in order to do that before giving an IEP has become much more common, correct? Yes, yeah, so that's very common practice that you try to see what interventions you can embed into the student's day that will help them be successful and see if those things work before you would go to, like I mentioned before, you would go to a case study evaluation for special ed service because of that reason it's such an investment and it is it's costly to a school district right i think that's the balance of of being financially responsible uh but yet using the funds to a level of that you're going to that the students you need in order to meet their needs that it, it, personally that's what i would say that's where you 
draw that balance between what are the resources we can provide for a student that's going to meet the needs that have been determined by that case study evaluation. Um, and that's that balance that, um, you know, this year, to be honest with some of the students that we have coming in from our eighth grade feeder schools is, um, like, like, like Kylie mentioned earlier, is one of my things that I've been talking about is I have a lot of kids that are coming that have not been in a traditional classroom, haven't had really real implemented IEP services and related services for a year and a half. Uh, so we've kind of really looked at, you know, not, not give them a full buffet of, of services, but okay, we might want to add a little bit here, uh, you know, really look at what is going to be necessary to bring them and, and close those gaps. And I think, you know, I'll touch on it later a little bit too, is why was it so important to have those, some of those kids and that, some of that population be with us to make sure that we could get those, those skills and those supports embedded into their, their day as opposed to uh, staying home. So, so you had said we're probably going to need another two and two point five FTE, but I don't know. So no, paraprofessional. No, no, no. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. No. So I was like, that's, I didn't see that. Was, that's no, a little no. different. Yeah. That was well, just, that's so just a little different. But it's it's not free. Right? Yeah. I mean, right. We pay those people. I hope we do. They, I know they do a good job. So, okay. Kevin, one of the things you talked about uh, on your next page. Uh, I know I think this is your last page of it, preparing for the last page. Uh, LRB Academy, and uh, I think on the 21-22 you had talked about, uh, I know you're looking to try to bring back a, a program. Uh, is it Life Skills? Yeah, so Life Skills was a program that we had uh, all day long uh, here at RB, and, and a lot of those are for kids with multiple disabilities. Um, that aren't just going to access the, the general ed population or, or, or curriculum. Um, those numbers dipped a little bit, so that program went away. I'm seeing an uptick in those numbers coming in. We have two young uh, people coming in next year that are going to need some access to that program. Uh, our freshman class this year had three or four kids that could benefit from that type of program. Um, and bringing them, uh, bringing that kind of program back, it's not a, a full five or six period day. Uh, a life skills program, but there's like two two of those life skills classes embedded with some vocational skill classes as well. Um, and then some of those kids will access some of the core classes uh, that they've been doing this year. The reason for that is that those could have been two potential kids that we'd have to be outplaced. Um, and, and to be honest, I like I want our kids to be in our building. I mean, it's, it's that connection to our community. Um, some of these kids are traveling far, far distances on buses to do their daily schooling. So when we get an opportunity to transition a student back to RB, that's a priority for me and I think uh, for the families. Um, and that's part of why the LRB Academy was created with Lansing and Lines Township. Um, we have, again, with our numbers going up and, and with our kids with emotional disabilities and, and struggling with the social emotional component, is they developed the school, the, I guess the three entities developed LRB Academy in our community in LaGrange Park. Those kids are not traveling 45 minutes to an hour, 20 minutes on a bus or a minivan or a cab to go to school one way each day. They're going to go five minutes, be in their community, and they still have that connection. Um, some of the kids that we have there, like I said, the three that are coming in as eighth graders, all three of those kids that are outplacement are going to go to LRB. Uh, LRB is not as expensive as the other out schools, other outplace schools that we use are therapeutic day schools. But it's they're geared and they list. I'm in direct contact with them on a daily, almost a daily basis with about some of the kids that are there. Um, some of the re credit recovery that we do in Apex, those kids are doing Apex over there uh, to get some of those, those classes made up. They have on, on site social workers uh, um, and they're transporting kids back and forth. And it's just, it allows them, if I want to try to bring them back, if we try, you know, tr traditionally when I bring a kid back from outplacement or a therapeutic day school, it wouldn't be an all or nothing. It would be a couple of classes at a time. I wouldn't want to set them up for a complete life change and then it all falls apart. All the work they've done to try to earn their way back or, or the growth and have it fall apart. It's usually going to be a one or two class period for about a quarter or a semester and then build those on for another semester to remain full time. Um, and it's, it's allows us a lot more uh, a connection with those kids and, and they're because they're ours we want them to be connected to RB and, and, and be close and still be in the community um, the 
to your question about LRB. I did provide a link in there. It's a great video that they have up to Lassie's website to kind of get a, a good uh, uh, idea about it. Ideally, I'd like to have you guys visit the school. It's really great what they've done in a year, um, but I haven't even visited yet because I'm not really in the mood of visiting places so right now. this is COVID. like an alternate to RB, like this is an actual school? It's an alternate high school okay. uh, setting for students. They, they be, are required to have, they have to have an IEP to attend that school. But yes. It's at St. Louis. Yes. Yep. As so, directing right. board of Lancy, we work together with LT, the superintendent, myself, and uh, the director for Lancy to uh, put together this program. And we've been working for two years to find a lease on a building, and with St. Louis, it was a central location. I mean, in 20 years ago, they were asking, I was a first year there, right? They were asking us for tons of money so they could build this community center and all these other things. It is a really, they got some really nice facilities there that are almost like brand new because there was such a low student population at St. Louis itself during these last 10, 15 years. So, I mean, some parts of that building are like in mint condition. So, so what's our enrollment? We've got three for, we have three incoming freshmen and how many other people will we have? How many other students? That are there now, that mm -hmm. were there? Ooh, that's a good question. I do have the numbers later though. I think I counted 12 staff members when I looked at the video. Oh, I didn't watch the video. Oh, it was good. We have a chance. Okay. But students are coming from both LT and our school there, right? Yes. Yeah. Yep, it's a combined enrollment. I guess maybe even five. 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 So is, is there a cap to, to what we could? No. Um, no, so if, if... We pay per kid. Okay. So so just so the board understands, like, one of the things about being a smaller school is 1,600 students, and we've obviously grown since that came here, but... Uh, the school district was involved with Lancy long before that. And the reason we do that is so we don't necessarily have enough uh, students in a particular programming area to where we would be able to support a full-time program at RB. But if you're part of the cooperative, this was us joining forces with LT. One of the issues with Lancy is it's predominant, with the exception of LT and RB, it's all um, K-8 districts. And so this was a really big accomplishment over the last two years to get this up and running because otherwise the, tr the services we were receiving more from Lancy were uh, professional development services for staffing, speech and language pathologists, school psychologists, uh, OTPT. But there, you know, it, it wasn't as many options where some of our feeder schools share programs like this, and they could send, you know, each of them donate a classroom or dedicate a classroom, and then it's. You know, all the first through third grade students from Lancy that have this disability at one school, and we haven't really been able to perfect that with the high school and only having two two schools. But so this is a big step forward with LRB. Mm -hmm. Pretty exciting. Now, touch on your last page, Kevin. Your stuff you're prepping for for 21-22 in your first official year as director. Yeah, um, as we're doing right now, I think we're just working through this the scheduling of the sectioning of. Um, current classes and then looking to to like I mentioned before of, of filling that program and his life skills uh, and voc vocational skills of, of bringing those that that work and that group together um, it's, it, previously this link was talked about the EF um, um, team if you the team that uh, the executive functioning team that we're really going to embed next year is predominantly uh, staff in the special education department um, that are passionate um, when we brought that up to these the team about bringing it back and, and and wanting to get the training for the staff they're super excited about pushing this out and it's going to benefit the kids it's going to benefit the staff again staff haven't been in a, a traditional school in a year and a half as well and and giving them some of those strategies in, in, in their classes and some of the must-haves to help classroom management as well as as that, that learning in those classes so really look forward to uh, that, that I would call it initiative I call it refresher of implementing those new EEF strategies into uh, uh, RB next year. Um, we did, they did, the team did get uh, PTO funding as well for some of the resources to help run this EF uh, team uh, that they're going to use to supply uh, um, materials and things for teachers and for the students next year uh, as they come into the building. Kevin, the blue, the blue page is just, uh, we asked Kevin to kind of highlight yeah. the, the four things he's going to focus on. So this just gives you a, a 
afford an idea. These are some things that Hector, myself, and Chris, and when we completed the interview process and met with Kevin and we offered Kevin the job, we wanted to prioritize his work mm -hmm. as a new director of special education for 21, 20, the 21 22 school year. So this just provides you a snapshot of where he's going to be focusing his efforts. Yep, uh, if there's questions about it, I can answer them. But just things that I have, uh, after doing the interim, position this year and then actually filled in for a few weeks, about six weeks last, the previous school year, some and feedback that I'm getting from uh, my, my colleagues in the department about things that they like to see, initiatives and, and th areas in which they want to grow, um, really looking at, uh, looking at the effectiveness of our co-teaching model here at RB uh, and identifying what that looks like, um, doing walkthroughs myself and surveys and talking to students and parents and staff, uh, and doing check-ins and um, continue to do some professional development I'm in contact with a, a one of the experts in the area of uh, co-teaching of, of possibly doing a training before we leave uh, the, uh, this school year uh, so like kind of like the EF things I want those things set before they leave and not try to give them something new uh, or something to kind of like put into their their classes when they come back in office it's it's, it's better to have something to work on with their co-teachers for many of my staff that do co-teach uh, to work and plan those things over the course of the summer as opposed to trying to ask them to do uh, these five co-teaching strategies that I want to see you guys all implement into your school day uh, for the first semester. Um, I think another thing, I have a lot of really talented and, and, and passionate people that I want to empower them to do some things here at RB that uh, they've been maybe been sitting on a little bit. That, you know, I think the EF was a big part of it. I have three or four staff members that they, I'm already, they're already signed up for college courses and and wanting to, to get planning these the PD days for the EF stuff, um, but really looking at where your passions lie, getting back to to uh, uh, be a special educator and the case management and, and providing them with resources to be so they can be the best they can uh, at, at those responsibilities. Um, special ed is, is tied to, 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 to the legal component of, of creating IEPs. It's evolving every few months we have new things that come up that I need to keep them up to date with and some training and, and better practices and, and making that process more efficient for them because creating IEPs and, and doing IEP meetings takes a long time to create and it is a legal document that we want to make sure that is, is spot on with again providing those services because the funding uh, a lot of times is, is allocated at an IEP meeting when you put services in place on, the, on that document. So what are those needs? What are we going to be able to do to meet those needs so that we can, again, be responsible uh, with those services and not just create a document just to create a document, but really specifically um, connected to the, that individual uh, student uh, and what they need to be successful and access the curriculum here at RB just like any gen ed student would. Um, the last one is um, uh, tied into the vocational training. We've started already. Uh, identifying a few groups of seniors in our department that we want to. Um, Lancy has a program that we use in our transition uh, programs that uh, it's called virtual job shadowing software licenses, and we have 11 of those that are still not being used. So we've identified 12 kids to uh, start this uh, virtual uh, job shadowing uh, option, and it's it it's goes a lot to the trades. You do a lot of um, it's like an interest inventory. But there's a neat component to it where a student can actually get connections with postings of internships and jobs that are currently available in our community. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a uh, right on the link, and they, they have um, you know, resumes and submit uh, information to, for those opportunities right there at, at that point. So we're, we're going to expand that to our next year's seniors and juniors. Uh, I'm getting more licenses from WASI to, to do that component. And, uh, Dirk and I know you talked to Ms. Delzati and we've been talking about how can we bring in those trades component as well yep. with the with um, with the school website and everything as well. So it's kind of I want to make sure we do these things together at the same time because we have kids that definitely are non traditional students that love to go into the trades. It's just understanding how to get that, that, the access of how to get there. Great job, Kevin. Is there any other questions for Kevin? Good job, Kevin. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Nice very job, Kevin. And guys, I just wanted to mention really quick, you know, now you know why we made him our director. 
He knows <laughs> students. He puts students first, uses the right words as an investment in our students. He knows programming, what our kids need, and more importantly, he has a vision for effectively using our resources. So I hope all the community knows those are some of the reasons why we brought Kevin Bald as our new director of special education. Nice job. Guys. All right. Thank you. Comprehensive. All right. Um, your colleagues stay to support you. Yeah, your water bottle. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work.